Hello historians and welcome to another Purple Shirt History. In this video, we'll be going over the coursework handbook. This is primarily meant for teachers, but students, you can also watch it to get a perspective as to what is required for the coursework component, which is component number three. It's a deep dive, so the video will be a bit longer, but watch to the end so you don't miss any of the important information within. As always, if you find this helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'd be more than happy to respond to you in the comments. So sit back, relax, grab your notebook, and enjoy the video. This is the coursework handbook that can be found on the school support hub. It's for examination 2024 and onward, so it's a new update. Coming onto the table of contents, this will be a longer video, so we're going to go over all of these parts in detail. Planning and teaching, coursework assignment, marking and moderation, example candidate coursework, and classroom activities. The majority of this video will be on the planning because that is what you will really need to concern yourself about. It is a very long process, the coursework. It goes over the course of a semester and it's something that you need to kind of have milestones for in order to make sure your students finish their work. If you don't monitor it closely, there is a big risk of students not finishing their work and that ultimately will affect their grade negatively, cause a lot of stress for you and be a big problem. So hopefully in this video, you'll see how to kind of go step by step and have markers that students will need to complete throughout the course of the semester. Coursework is an optional component. You have the choice of doing this component three coursework or paper four. I don't like coursework to be honest, or if, to be charitable, I like paper four more. I'm not gonna go on a big diatribe about coursework. I think most of it has to do with we did paper four at my old school and then converted over to coursework and it was a bit of a mess and it kind of put a sour taste in my mouth for coursework. We were getting very good results with the paper four. There was a decision made to change over to coursework and the results went down. So I felt quite bad for my students that were in that first year of coursework. So maybe it just has to do with that experience I had. If you do coursework and you love it, fantastic. I'm, I know there's pros to it. It gets them to be more ready for university when they have to do long essays. It has bibliography, research skills, how to do work cited. There's a lot to be done that is very positive about coursework, but I do think the negatives for me really stick out in my mind in terms of having to rely on students to be responsible at a pretty young age. It takes a lot of work on the teachers and to keep them on track, making sure that work is original and all that kind of stuff. So if you've done both, I'd love to hear your comments uh, like I have. I've, I've done the paper four and the coursework. You can absolutely disagree with me if you think coursework is better than paper four. It does offer the option of getting one giant component out of the way before the exam season. So I think that's probably the best thing, that they can get it taken care of and then they can just focus on their paper one and paper two in the springtime for the, you know, around um, May. And they don't have to worry about the paper four, but there, there you go, to each his own. The coursework will be on your depth study. IGCSE is a two-year program, or the way I've always taught it has been a two-year program. If you have to teach it in one year, Godspeed, because that's a lot to go over in one year. Under the usual circumstances, year 10, or in the U.S., a freshman year, that will be the year that you do the core content, so what you'll do on paper one and paper two. That whole year, is that's a lot to do. In the second year, year 11, or sophomore year in the US, this is when you'll do the depth study and when you'll do coursework. Do not try to do coursework, paper one and paper two in the same year, unless it's unavoidable. It, that is an, a lot to do for the students. So we look at this section, when to do coursework, 
do it in that second year of the IGCSE course when you're doing your depth study. The German depth study is what I'm doing. I would not deviate into my coursework during the first year when I'm doing my core content. It's just too many things for the kids to juggle. I would not recommend doing any coursework or besides mentioning this is what you'll do next year in the first year of IGCSE when you're going over your core content. That last bullet point is the most pertinent in this set of bullet points. It is unwise to tackle coursework too early in the course because learners will not be familiar enough with the overall period and will have made little progress in developing their skills in understanding. Unwise to me is an understatement. They're basically starting from zero, what they've had in history and so or social studies in the previous years won't help them much. The beginning of the second year is a good time to start the depth study and the coursework. It's more working backwards, meaning you'll have to kind of refresh the core content from the previous year when you have mock exams and when you have some assessments and things like that. That is something that needs to be done to be comprehensive for the exam, but do not bring in the coursework in year one. Role of the teacher. Teachers can offer general guidance on how best to approach a coursework question, but must be careful not to exert too much influence over the candidate's decisions. First and foremost, don't cheat. We are living in the age of chat GPT. We are living in the age of a lot of information being available that sounds like it's written by a student. It's going to have big ramifications on the coursework, I think, in the next couple years. We shall see what happens. It's one of those things that technology and plagiarism and all these things are in play and may affect how coursework is done in the future. I have no idea, but that's my best guess. Teachers must be careful to avoid directly addressing the coursework question or the issues implicit within it during teaching and learning of the depth study. It is also the teacher's responsibility to ensure the work learners complete is entirely their own work. It is up to you to make sure that it is original content that they're producing. We used a website called turnitin.com, which is an anti-plagiarism site. It is a paid service, so you'll need to talk with your school administrator to get the budget for that. So it is a real issue that you need to make sure that the work is original. They cannot be directly helped by you as the teacher, and they must have original content. One bit of advice that I would give over a couple years of doing the coursework now is do the same question every year. At the previous score, I said there were some difficulties with the coursework. We were changing the question every single year, and you don't have to. It's completely fine by Cambridge. It's not against the rules to do the same question year after year. I spoke with a teacher who did the same question for over a decade, and it was fine. You can't direct the student in answering that question. Of course, it has to be original by the student. But you as the teacher, if you do the same question or they're thereabouts the same question, you can continue to hone your resources you can hone your understanding of that particular question, and you can make excellent lessons to write coursework for that depth study that you're doing. So you'll be a better teacher, more prepared, instead of having to constantly make new resources and start from scratch every single year with a new coursework question, which is something that I experienced, and it was a mistake. Coursework should be no longer than 2,000 words. Any words beyond 2,000 words will not be assessed. On the length of the coursework, yes, 2,000 words may seem like a lot for a year 11 student, but it should be broken down into 500 word chunks, I would say, for their body paragraphs. So three body paragraphs we go over the big themes, and this works for any question. So you may have a 500-word assignment on the economics of Nazi Germany or Russia or the U.S. or whatever. That's a, a big bucket where a lot of different things can be stored. So that gives a nice general idea of what can be done 
if there's anything about the question concerning the economy. And then another big bucket would be the politics. The politics of the country you're talking about, if it's Germany, there's the Nazi takeover. If you're doing Russia, it's Lenin and Stalin. If it's the U.S., there's a number of different topics there and changes in presidents and political parties controlling Congress or whatever. All of this stuff can be seen in a 500-word paragraph that would give them an overview of the political situation. So society can be the third big bucket. Religion, uh, ethnicities, minorities and majorities, how they get along or don't get along. Oligarchy or autocracy or democracy or whatever. All the different things, how the society functions, the media. I had a student do a great project on the film Metropolis by Fritz Lang, which was a kind of which was a gem, a movie classic of the Weimar period, and it showed the openness and the experimentation of the Weimar government, which the Nazis hated. So things like this, you know, this can be used later in the coursework. It's not directly, you're not giving them the question and they're directly answering it, but they have a general idea of what's going on in society, in the economy, in politics, in military, in gender, in, you know, family life, in education, and all these types of different things. So the body paragraphs are about 500 words a piece, and then you, that leaves you 500 words for your introduction and conclusion. So you've budgeted out the coursework. The citations and stuff like that don't count towards your word count. But if you break it down like that into smaller pieces, it makes it much less daunting to write 2,000 words than it would be if you just said, oh, okay, by the end of Christmas, you guys have to have a 2,000-word essay for me. You'll okay. see some jaws hit the floor. It seems very intimidating. But, but if you go at the beginning of the year, by the end of the month, we're going to write a 500-word essay on economics. I find economics is a good one to start with because – most students understand that money is important to pol politics and society. Yeah, who knew? These types of economic issues, if there's the Great Depression, if there's boom times, if whatever, there's going to be uh, impacts on the society. The coursework must be a single question. There are a number of examples you can look at this coursework handbook and take from directly. You can have a question that you make up yourself and Cambridge can approve it. So if you're the head of history, you can look into that. If you're not, you can check it out with your head of history. So it should have a single question. It should not be a multi-parter or anything. It shouldn't be that complex. And the main word that we need to focus on when you do coursework is significance. Significance is, I think I've written it 5,000 times over the past couple years, students need to write the word significance for each aspect of the coursework and then in the conclusion, the overall significance of what's going on. The word is significance. 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 You can see in constructing a question and in the answers is the command word. If you haven't thought of a question or if you don't want to make one up yourself, just grab one of these from the handbook. The following questions would be suitable. Assess the significance of Lenin in the period 1917 to 1931. So assess. How significant was autarky for the Nazi regime? How significant? How far do you agree with the statement? In the area of civil rights, President Kennedy was a very significant figure. How far do you agree with this statement? There isn't a mandatory referencing system, so I use MLA. That's what I'm used to, and that's, that's what I'm very familiar with. I give the students an excellent website, owl.purdue.edu, and it's called the Online Writing Lab from the University of Purdue in Indiana. Indiana? I'm pretty sure it's Indiana. Yes, this is a positive for coursework. They learn how to 
do referencing. They learn how to write a bibliography, and this is a skill that they will need down the road. So I'm putting this firmly in the, the pro side of coursework. How many sources do the students need to include in their coursework? I've heard six is okay, but I always like to give more. So between eight and 12 is what I'm looking for. So there should be a variety of sources. Of course, they're going to use their textbook or textbooks. So they have the core content textbook where there's depth study material in the back, the Ben Walsh book, and they have the access to history books from Jeff Layton and Michael Lynch, I believe, are the two that write the German books for access to history, depth study. Websites, there's BBC Bite Size, Spartacus Educational Alpha History, uh, the Historical Association websites. Please be on the lookout for Wikipedia. Do not let them use Wikipedia as a source, please. Historical articles, there's journals. I think podcasts are excellent. And there are great YouTube channels for history as well, besides this one, of course. So Dan Snow's History Hit. I think he'll be my shout-out for this particular video. Documentaries, yeah, BBC. TV documentaries. The BBC one for the Nazis, uh, Warning from History, is, is amazing. I remember watching that in the 90s, and it was, uh, yeah, one of the best things I ever saw at that time, so... I think that would be great to use as a resource. All right, marking and moderation. You will need to internally mark this. So get your whole department together. You should ask the head of humanities or whatever line manager you have for some time off or get cover for that particular day and then have an internal moderation session. These are the two objectives, AO1 and AO2. So what we did is we got the students that were high, middle, and low up to that point in class, made photocopies for the people marking it, and just compared and contrasted and moderated based on the different bands. And I found that to be a good process. They will be externally moderated. And the coursework handbook goes through significance and how to measure it for pages and pages, breadth and width and significance across time and all these different things. You can take your time reading all those pages. But this is a key aspect of marking this piece of work. You must annotate the coursework pretty heavily so grab a red pen and make sure you're making ample notes for the people at Cambridge to look at as well to justify the marks that you're given. So the people at Cambridge will look at all your annotation to make sure that they've reached the level that you've given them. And then you need to write a summary at the end. The level and mark awarded should be shown at the end of the answer with summative comments. There are examples that you'll see here in the handbook. We'll briefly look at one of the summative comments. And what needs to be done is just to make sure there's consistency around the marking. Any leniency or severity will be ironed out if three people look at the same piece of work and an agreement can be reached. You're not going to have to remark every single page of every single coursework But samples should be remarked until everything is nice and consistent. So the coursework of a sample of learners will be externally moderated. The sample of work submitted for external moderation should represent the range of marks, like we said, high, middle, and low, and include a balance of work from candidates across all teaching sets and assessors. This is all incredibly important if you're the head of history and you're the person submitting it. So you need the candidate numbers for the students, uh, your center, so that your school's number from Cambridge, copy of forms and all this type of stuff. So this is for the person who's going to submit it. You can read this and 
see what needs to be done. Here are some websites where you can find all the forms, samples, administration of coursework and all that. So that's great. Let's go down to the summative contents. The first paragraph you'll have will just be an overview. And then the second paragraph will be the positive aspects of the coursework. And lastly, you'll state the weaknesses of the coursework. So you're showing balance and your overall evaluation of the coursework. Assess the significance of the USA in the 1964 coup in Brazil. Inline comments, as you can see. And here is a lot of summative comments. This was a 25 out of 40, level 3, pros, cons, overall evaluation. Last one, was Al Capone an important figure in American history? Again, we see comments right from the beginning for the introduction. The boy doesn't, boy or girl doesn't use. As we see right in the beginning, there's notes, annotations. You could read this on your own time. But down to the summative comments, this is an excellent piece of coursework, according to the assessor. So we see the focus on Al Capone, the significance, nicely deployed information, balance on the argument, little negative marks about organization, relevance and focus. So this is an excellent essay. So it got 38 out of 40, which is a strong level of five. Finally, we'll end up with some classroom activities. Organize all of the names within your depth study. So every single person of significance, pick them out of the textbooks of any of the websites, any of the podcasts, any of the documentaries, any of the articles that you've come across and make a list and see how significant they are. So kids can make a poster. If they're very significant, the picture of them can be huge and they can have a big write-up. If they're of smaller significance, they can have a little tiny picture or maybe only one or two lines about them. But yeah, great people, activity one. I like that. Events, same thing as the people. How much impact did they have? How big were they? How long-lasting were they? The example that they give here is somebody selling gingerbread in by Manchester in England being killed versus the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary being assassinated and starting World War I. So what's the difference in terms of impact of those two murders? So you can compare and contrast. You can show how events, again, what do you think had the longest lasting impact, the biggest impact, the breadth of the impact, all that kind of stuff. So I like that activity as well. And have students agglomerate the past learning. What always keeps coming up in the history books and their research? If they see something brought up six, seven, eight times, so if something about the Great Depression is mentioned in every single document about the rise of the Nazis, be it a textbook or any other type of historical research, yes, the Great Depression needs to be mentioned in the coursework. Yes, the Great Depression is incredibly significant. Night of the Long Knives is also highly significant, but it may be restricted only to books about the Nazis after 1933 or how they were running the government or the rise of Hitler or consolidation of power. Night of the Long Knives may not be as well known as the Great Depression, but it is also in a lot of books, so the students will pick them out as significant, and it's up to them to see how significant they think it is. And explanation cards. I love flashcards. I mean, flashcards are the best, especially when you have 
students who speak English as a second language just to do language skills and to learn facts. It's excellent. So explanations, categories, you can check out how to use the flashcards, cause and effect, consequences, categories, all these types of things. Very good stuff.